This is for educational use only. Her group is allowing our structure, Mr. Roldan Aldinis, to use this as an educational material. Good day, sir, and my fellow classmates. I'm signed to talk about identifying the global governance and how it helps us in the midst of COVID-19 that we're experiencing right now. Our topic will be, will be global governance with the integration of COVID-19 pandemic will be reported by me, Junior Glenford. Next is explain the effects of globalization on governments will be reported by Burden Rovick Dave. Next will be identify the institutions that govern international re relations. I'll be talking about Caraldi Ariel and differentiate internationalism from globalization. globalization. Will be reported by Lavaris Christian Paul. And next topic will be identify the rules and functions of the United Nations. Will be reported by Obal Jan Charlon and identify the challenges of global governance in the 21st century will be talked about Kabigas Garvin James and lastly explain the relevance of the state amid globalization that will be explained by Pakanya Jericho. Objectives To understand what is glo global governance and how it helped to prevent much more casualties in the COVID-19 virus. So let's start. Global governance refers to institutions that coordinate the behavior of transnational actors, facilitate cooperation, solve dis disputes, and alleviate collective active problems. Global governance broadly entails making, monitoring, and enforcing rules. Within global governance, a variety of types of actors, not just states, exercise powers. Governance is thus broader than government. Global governance began in the mid-19th century. It became particularly prominent in the aftermath of World War I, and more so after the end of World War II. Since World War II, the number of international organizations has increased substantially. The number of actors, whether the AB states, non-governmental non organization, uh, firms and epistemic communities who are involved in the governance re relationship has also increased substantially. Various terms have been used for the dynamics of global governance such as complex independence, international regimes, multi-level governance, global constitutionalism, and ordered anarchy. Global governance brings together diverse actors to coordinate collective action at the level of planet. The goal of global governance, roughly defined, is to provide global public goods, particularly peace and security, justice and mediation systems for conflict, functioning markets and unified standards for trade and industry. Our crucial global public good is catastrophic risk management putting appropriate mechanism in place to maxim maximally reduce the likelihood and impact of any event that cause of death of 10% of humanity across the planet or damage of equivalent magnitudes. The leading institution in charge of global governance today is the United Nations. It was founded in 1945 in the wake of the Second World War as a way to prevent future conflicts on that scale. The United Nations does not directly bring together the people of the world, but sovereign nation states and currently counts 193 members who make recommendations through the UN General Assembly. The UN's main mandate is to preserve global security, which does particularly through the Security Council. In addition, the UN can settle international legal issues through the International Court of Justice and implements its key decisions through the Secretariat led by the Secretary General. The United Nations has added a range of areas to its core mandate since 1945, 
It works through a range of agencies and associated institutions, particularly to ensure greater shared pro prosperity as a desired goal in itself and as a direct way to increase global stability. As a key initiative in that regard, in 2015, the, U the UN articulated the Sustainable Development Goals, creating common goals for the collective future of the planet. Beyond the UN, other institutions with a global mandate play an important role in the global governance. Of primary importance are the so-called Bretton Woods Institution, the World Bank, and the IMF, whose function is to regulate the global economy and credit markets. Those, those institutions are not, are not without their critics for this very reason, being often blamed for maintaining economic inequality. Global governance is, a, is more generally effective through a range of organizations acting as intermedi intermediary bodies. This includes bodies in char charge of regional coordinations, such as the EU or ASEAN, which coordinate the policies of their members in a certain geographical zone. Those, those also include strategic or economic initiatives under the leadership of one country. NATO for the U.S. or China's Belt and Road Initiative for instance, or more generally coordinating defense or economic integration such as APEC or ANZUS. Finally, global governance relies on loser norm setting forums such as the G20, the G7, the World Economic Forum. Those do not set up treaties but offer space for gathering discussion ideas, aligning policy and setting norms. This last category could be extended to multi-stakeholder institutions that aim to align global standards. For instance, the Internet Engineering Task Force, IETF, and the World Wide Web Consortium, called 3 c What do the global governance do with the integration of COVID-19 pandemic? In times of crisis, such as the current COVID-19 pandemic and its economic and social reper repercussions, public governance matters more than ever. Governance arrangements have played a critical role in the country's immediate responses and will continue to be crucial both to the recovery and the building a new normal once the crisis has passed. The OECD has been taking stock of country responses and developing analysis and recommendations on a range of public governance topics. The resulting evidence-based policy responses below are designed to help governments tackle the crisis and plan for a sustainable recovery. Next reporter will be Ravik Day Burden. So hi guys, I am Engine Cadet Ravik Day Burden. Uh, representing Team Zuniga. So my report is about the effects of globalization in government. So first, let is let us uh, know what is globalization. So globalization is a uh, advance or um, new to the country or um, belong in a particular place that make or uh, let, let us say new to everyone because it might affect the market the market, the transportation, the way of living of every person in, in the place that he lived in. So, um, based on my uh, presentation over there, uh, globalization is very uh, unpredictable because we d we don't want to have that 
in our um, place or in our country to be uh, discovered so the the inventor or let us say uh, discover the globalization he studies what the evolution in the place or um, in a country like uh, Russia and Ukraine that uh, we um, suffering like right now the globalization they uh, adapt adapted and the market is very high and their oil like gasoline uh, diesel uh, is very expensive now because of the war and other countries suffer it too so the crisis is very um, spread all over the world and others are kind of aching in their budgets because they cannot afford easily the gasoline right now they will pray to be gone to be back to normal in, in this coming days weeks or months so in merits of uh, globalization we can know the uh, news as I said uh, we can easily attach or know what is happening outside our country like the crisis now in Russia and Ukraine so let us uh, help each other because they need us and every time this uh, crisis they suffer and let us pray for them to be safe and um, succeed the um, crisis they suffered this pandemic also they, they are not um, fully recover in about in COVID so the government cannot help them easily because they also fight for their country to defend and fight so that's all and Thank you for listening. I hope you have knowledge and new learnings about my discussion. Bye. Hello everyone. This is Engine Cadet Ariel Caralde. And let's talk about the institutions that govern international relations. But first, with us, let us know what is international relations. International relations is a scientific study of interactions between sovereign states. It concerns all activities between states such as war, diplomacy, trade, and foreign policy, and relations with and among other international actors. For, so for our main main question, what what are the institutions that govern international relations? The institutions are divided into four categories. First is the generalist organization. Second is the economic institutions. Third is the international legal bodies. And last is the security arrangements. So I pick only two examples for each category. For generalist organization, we have the United Nations or UN. Second is the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, or the ASEAN. 
and for the economic institutions, we have the World Bank and World Trade Organization. For international legal bodies, we have International Court of Justice and International Tribunal for Law of the Sea. Last is the security arrangements. The United Nations Security Council. And second is the NATO or the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. The main goal of these institutions is to maintain peace and help each country to be better. So that's all and I hope that you have learned something from this video. Good day sir, I'm Christian Paul Abares and I'm the one who will report this topic. Differentiate internationalism from globalism. And international, internationalism can be defined as the principle of cooperation among states for the promotion of their common good sometimes as contrasted with nationalism or devotion to the interest of a particular nation. Globalism is the connection of different parts of the world, resulting in the expansion of international, cultural, economic, and political activities. It is the movement and integration of goods and people among different countries. So the internationalism is to produce goods or deliver and have the capability to entering into the international market and the other hand the globalism it talks about the connectivity whether it is cultural connectivity economic connectivity and political connectivity difference between internationalism and globalism Internationalism means to expand the business and enter into the market of different countries. It is the process in which business, firm or an individual expands and becomes part of the other countries. It may be for good supply, customer base or such other demand fulfillment. And globalism means connecting the economies of the world for free for free trade and economic policies to integrate the world into the global village. It is the process of opening the economies of the nation for the other nations and to sync the rules and regulations with other nations. So um, keep in mind that internationalism is all about entering and doing business in other states and while the globalism is all about the trade and connectivity among nations or states and the best example for internationalism for me is intergovernmental organization or IGO such as the EU African Union World Bank UN, NATO, Asian, IPCC, and etc. And the, for example, of globalism is advanced in technology such as mobile phones, airplanes, the telephones, and the internet have made the growth, Trump food, and communication network possible. Among other things, this means that people and countries can exchange information and goods more quickly and in, in, an, in a less complicated way. The Comparison of Globalism and Internationalism First, globalism is more with the nations and their economies while internationalism is more related to the individuals, firm and com corporations for doing up their business. Second, major factors that affect the globalism are interfactional and logistic setup, telecommunications, etc. While internationalism gets affected by cultural taste and preferences side by side, local tra tradition, etc. 
The third one is the major example of globalism is elimination of visa obligation removing tariff in non-tariff trade, barriers liberalizing investment related obligations, etc. While an example of internationalism is sourcing, producing, or selling materials or deliver delivering service from one or more countries, setting up of the branches and subsidiaries in other countries. And the fourth one is globalism is an economic process at its aims in integrating the economies while internationalism is an improvisation process it, it will lead in expanding of the business across the nations. And the last one is globalism is the end result while internationalism is one of the task tools or processes to achieve them. And that's all for this video. Thank you. Good day everyone. By the way, my name is John Jordan Gilby and I'm from Group 5. So I'm here to talk about the relevance of this of the state I made globalization. So first our objectives. So what are our objectives to at the end of this lesson we should be to understand what is the relevance of it and to gain more knowledge about the state I made globalization. So first let's talk about the state. State is uh, derived from the word status and is a distinctive distinctive political community with its own set of rules and practice and that is a more or less separate from the other communities. So it has uh, four elements which is first is people or population, the second is territory and the third is government and the fourth is sovereignty. So let's talk about the first element which is people and population. So the first element of a state permanent population, this population does not refer to a nomadic people that move from one place to another and an in indefinite time. So that's our first element. So let's move on to the second element which is territory. This permanent presence in one location is threatened by the second element of a state and a territory has a clear boundaries which is effectively controlled by the third element which is the government so that, uh, that our third element is the government. There can be no state without government because government regulates relationships uh, relations among its own people with other states and in order to make an enforced law the state must have the highest authority so that's the government so the last one of the elements is the sovereignty sovereignty is a supreme authority um, within a territory and any states or sovereignty is assigned to person or institution that has the ultimate authority over other people in order to establish a law or a change an existing law so it means supreme as and final legal authority above and beyond which no legal power exists so it has uh, two aspects of sovereignty which is the first is internal it means that the state is supreme or supreme of supreme over all it, its citizens and association and uh, second is external which means that it stays independent and free from outside control so that's uh that ha that's is the two aspects of severity so let's move on to nations um, nations derive from latin word nation which means birth of or race so so it means it refers to a people or rather than any kind of formal territorial boundaries or institutions. So it's a collective identity grounded on a nation, on a notion of shared history and culture. So that's the nation it means. So the second is the nation state. It is a state in which a great majority shares the same and shares the same in culture and constitution of it so nation state 
it is an ideal in which cultural boundaries match up with political boundaries so that's the nation state so what are the rule of nation states so the rule of nation state is globalization is a complex one in a part due to the varying definitions and shifting concepts of globalization so while it has been defined in many ways the globalization is generally recognized as the fading or complete disappearance of economy state a social and cultural borders between the nation state so some scholars uh, have characterized that nation state which are inherently divided by the physical and, and economic boundaries will be less relevant in global globalized world so that's the role of nation in globalization so the relevance of state of image globalization is the globalization offers extensive opportunities for truly worldwide development but it is uh, not progressing evenly so globalization offers um, some countries are becoming integrated into the global economy and more quickly than others and some countries that have been able to integrate are seeing faster growth and reduce poverty of it and it creates greater opportunities for firms in less industrialized countries to tap into more and larger markets around around the world so this can lead to more access to capital flows technologies human human capital cheap imports and larger exports so globalization allows countries to benefit from economy synergy and collaborate in hand, handling political social and economic challenges so the people of each state now deal with people of other state as a member of the world community so the loyalty towards their respective state continues but now now the people does not hesitate to oppose the state policy which are held to be not in not in tune with the demands of globalization so with people of each state now deal with people of each country nation nationwide easily used because to the world nowadays a, peop, a phone or instant message fax or conference because phone or instant message or fax or video conference call can easily be used to consume consume locally grown food but in the market a global economy expand the reach of buyers and sellers for government uh, governments and countries so that's the that's all for the relevance of the state amid globalization so thank you for your listening and have a great day god bless good day everyone I am Jerko P. Pakanya and I am here to talk all about the challenges of global governance. So, our objective for today is to identify the challenges of global governance in the 21st century. So, let's start with the problem of hunger. As we all know that hunger is one of the critical challenges today in global governance. Knowing that there are millions of people who are hungry, maybe due to their financial situation, government corruption and etc and according to the worldvision.org they have said on their article in africa as year 2020 that the number of hungry people continue to rise as 228 millions of people were experiencing hunger more than double the proportion of the any other region in the world as clearly stated in the article each government in the country must find a way to resolve this problem Next is poverty. This problem of poverty continue to rise in our world. We can see this in our country which is Philippines. People who experience poverty are dealing with different problems such as the food they eat, the shelter they live, and the water they drink, and etc. And because of that, it increases the crimes and illegal activities here in Philippines. And in that circumstances, it became one of the problem in global governance which needs to be resolved. Climate change. 
climate change is a long-term change in the average weather patterns that have come to define Earth's local, regional, and global. These human-produced temperature increases are commonly referred to as, as a global warming. This includes warming temperatures and changes in precipitation as well as the effects of Earth's warming such as rising sea levels, ice melting faster rate than usual in Greenland, Antarctica, and Arctic. The reason why it affects the global governance because climate change is a major threat to international peace and security. The effects of climate change heighten competition for resources such as land, food, water, fueling, socioeconomic tension, and increasingly often leading to mass displacement. Floods Floods are the most frequent type of natural disaster and occur when an overflow of water submerged land that is usually dry. Floods are often caused by heavy rainfall, rapid snow melt, or a storm surge from a tropical cyclone or a tsunami in coastal areas. It affects the global governance in terms of destroying the food sources and transportation routes, public areas, and the environment which incurs enormous cost for government. Food Food is one of our needs in order to survive and because of that, it became a problem in the global governance in the 21st century. The world is facing a crisis in global food security as the global population increases and the diet change with economic development. The population is increasing, meaning more mouths to feed and it is unlikely that it will be stabilized by the end of the century, which means that these problems need to be resolved and to make an immediate action for this. Terrorism is the unlawful use of force or violence against person to intimidate or coerce a government or its citizen to further certain political or social objectives. Terrorism affects global governance because it is an act of overtaking a place or a country and they are supported by other government or country for the sake of their hidden agenda such as to get more power and etc. that could imbalance the world. New technologies, mounting of concerns that these new technologies and how they are used will pose serious challenges including labor force dislocations and other market disruptions and new risks to public safety and national security. New technologies affects global governance in two ways. One is the positive and negative. The good example for the positive side is quality education and training, in which it develop and enhance our skills in the future. In our case as a seafarer, we have this technology in our school that is called and that is what we are using right now is simulation. And because of that, we tend to expand our knowledge and skills that corresponds in our profession. This technology has a huge impact in our education where it provides students with easy access information, accelerated learning, and fun opportunities to practice what they learn. It also enables students to explore, explore new subjects and deepen their understanding of difficult concepts. And also for the negative side, the most common problem we see every day is what we call fake news. Because of the new advancement of the new technologies, disseminating fake news can be more easier. Technologies can either be a good or a positive depending on the situation such as the impact on the workforce in the future. Because of the emerging technologies such as industrial robots, artificial intelligence, and machine learning are advancing at a rapid pace. 
these developments can improve the speed, quality, and cost of goods and services. But they will also displace a large numbers of workers. Any company owner, establishments, and businesses will be happy to have a robot and AI as their workers to save more money. But when we look on the other side, millions of workers will experience the negative effect on which they will lose their job in the future. In the future. Good day everyone, I am Injin Cadet Kabiga, so today we will talk all about the folds and function of United Nations. So um, first is, what is United Nations? Um, United Nations is, is the United Nations is the inter, intergovernmental organization aiming to maintain international peace and security, develop, develop friendly relations among nations, achieve international cooperation, and be center for harmonizing the actions of the nations. It is the world's largest and the most familiar international organizations. The organization is founded in 1945, currently made up of 193 member states, the UN, and its work, work are guided by the purposes and the principles contained in its founding charter. The next is the main bodies. Main bodies of the United Nations are generally assembly or the security council to the economic, not social council, the, the trust, trusteeship council and the international court of justice. And the uh, UN, UN Secretariat always established under the UN Charter when the organization was founded in 1945. So first is the General Assembly. The General Assembly is the main delib deliberative policy making and the representative organ of an UN. All the member states of the UN are represented in, in General Assembly, making it the only UN body with the universal representation. And decisions on, on important questions such as those peace and security, admissions of new members, budgetary matters requires two-thirds majority of the General Assembly. Decisions on other questions are by simple majority and the General Assembly each year elects a GA president to save a one-year term of office. Economic and Social Council the, the Economic and Social Council is the principal body for, for coordination policy review policy dialogue and recommendation on economic social and environmental issues as well as implementation of the internationally agreed agreed development goals it serves as the central mechanism for activities of the un un systems and its specialized agencies in the economic social and the environmental fields so supervising Sub subsidiary and the exports bodies then next is the trusteeship council the trusteeship council was established in 1945 by the un charter under chapter chapter 8 to provide international super, supervision for 11 trust territories that had been placed placed under the administrations of seven member states and ensure ensure that the adequate steps were taken to prepare the territories for self-government and dependence by by 1994 all trust territories had attained self-government and independence international court court of justice it is the principal judicial organ of the united nations it sits is as the peace palace in the 
Netherlands. It is the only one of the six principal organs of the United Nations not located in New York, United States of America. The court is ruled to settle in accordance with international law. Legal disputes submitted to by its states and to give advisory opinions on legal questions referred to it by authorized United Nations organs and specialized agency in the International Court of Justice function in accordance with its, its statute. Security Council. The Security Council has has primarily primary responsibility under the UN Charter for the maintenance of international peace and security. It has 15 members, 5 permanent and 10 non-permanent members. Each member has one vote under the charter. All all member states are ob obligated to to comply with council decisions. Secretariat. The secretariat comprises the secretary general and ten of thousands of international UN staff members who carry out the day-to-day -day work of the UN as mandated by the General Assembly and the organization's other principal bodies. The Secretary General is, is Chief Administrative Officer of the organization, appointed by the General Assembly, Assembly on the recommendation of the Security Council for a five-year renew, renewable term. The Secretary General is also a symbol of the organization's ideals and an advocate for all the world's peoples, especially for the poor, poor and the vulnerable. The next is the next is the functions of the of UN or United Nations. First is the maintenance of international peace and security. Second is a peace peace peacekeeping, peacemaking, and the peace building, arms control and disarmament, economic welfare and cooperation, economic reconstruction, financing, economic development, human rights, trade and development, social welfare and cooperation, control of narcotics, health and welfare issues, the environment, and development of inter international law so that's all thank thank you for listening